It's so interesting. It's so interesting. It's so, it's so interesting. interesting. It's interesting. Welcome to It's So Interesting, where people talk about their work and life experience. I am George Spitzer. I have with me Colonel Janet Horton, retired, chaplain from the U.S. Army. She continues being very active in her field as a chaplain in the Christian tradition. I would like to ask you to start off with to describe the scope, not so much of your work, but what it is the U.S. Army has in its chaplaincy. In other words, how many chaplains are in the Army? How many chaplains are there in the whole U.S. military? How many men in the military in general use the office of the chaplain? Just be approximate, because it changes all the time. Mm -hmm. But uh, what I, I want our people to understand how big the work did. I mean, it's a, it was a huge job. Well, I know from having worked in the Pentagon that we had over 1,500 Army chaplains. The Navy and the Air Force would also have chaplains themselves. And I don't know that I could tell you the numbers of people in the American military. That's changed so radically depending on what our engagements are. I don't know what they were at the time. Sounds like it would be safe to say it would be in the thousands. Oh, absolutely yeah, in the thousands. That's a yeah. lot of yeah. chaplains. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, of course, in the terms of ranking, as in any military operation, you rise from, what did you start off uh, as? Because you're a professional branch and you have to have graduate studies, you actually come in as a captain, which is officer level three. Mm -hmm. Many people would rise to the rank of lieutenant colonel, mm -hmm. which would be 05 or 06, officer level six, which mm -hmm. is a full colonel. And then we just have a token one star who's your deputy chief of chaplains, and then mm -hmm. your two star that's your chief of chaplains. And then beyond that? That's, that's the top you can go. You were a colonel. Were the... Right. That's that's just below the one-star level. That's as um, high as you can go without being either a deputy chief of chaplains or a chief of chaplains. And, and as your position, and you retired approximately 10 years ago, if I remember, you were very much involved in the Pentagon because that's where policy was set. And you had to deal with all sorts of things. And that was the time of the Bosnian War, I think it was? Uh, I, no, I had two tours. The first mm -hmm. tour was during Desert Storm. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was in personnel at that time. Mm -hmm. the, and so that would be at the Department of the Army level. My mm -hmm. final tour from starting in 2000 through 2003 in the Pentagon was at the Department of Defense level. So I was actually working for one of the undersecretaries for personnel and readiness. Later on, I'm going to cover a few of the facts of your career. But I was fascinated in having just read your memoirs, which will be published by Nebadoon Press, that you were very blessed either through ignorance or spiritual intuition, everyone has different perspectives of it, that you came to Boston from an upbringing in the Midwest, you got off the boat, so to speak, and then one day you got yourself a job, a place to live, and were admitted into the theological seminary in town, all of which all take many months or years of planning. You did all this in a 24-hour period, or if not less, 12-hour period. Did you realize how blessed you were? Oh, absolutely. It, when I realized, I, I thought I was just coming for a final interview at the, at the Mother Church. Which is a, which which is, is that? the First Church of Christ Scientist in, here in Boston. Which is Christian science. Which is Christian science. Yeah. I thought that probably they would help me with the process, but the individual who was the endorser and the trainer for chaplains at the time said, well, this is your demonstration. So he just kind of threw me back out the door and said, "You maybe you just want to go over and talk to Boston oh, University. How loving. You just cut you loose. Well, but I think he was understanding that you need to know how to be a chaplain. So you need to know how to pray and you need to know mm. how to, to have the healing that you need. In just the few hundred feet I went over towards Boston University, I ended up right in front of the Christian Science Reading Room on Massachusetts Avenue. Mm -hmm. I was kind of realizing what I had done, that I was now in the big city and I didn't have a clue what I was doing. And I almost became dizzy. I was so overcome by fear. But I knew that God hadn't given us fear. That's what I started to think. And I looked up and I was actually looking into the reading room there was a poster there that had a little girl, and she was running through a field of daisies, and it said, is there a substance that can't be used up? And it said, God is love, and it quoted the Gospel of John. And it was as if every bit of fear and mesmerism left. 
was as if somebody snapped their fingers. Everything became absolutely clear. I walked to Boston University, got lost in a building, explained to a man that I wanted to be a chaplain and that I wanted to go to, to the theology school. And he said, well, this isn't the theology school. But he asked me why, where I had come from. I explained I was from Iowa and I had no money and I had planned I would work for a year so that I could then go to seminary. And he looked at me and he said, no, you're not going to. He, and he started writing something on pieces of paper and putting it in envelopes. And he took me over to a window because we were fairly high up in a building. And he pointed out the window and showed me where the actual seminary building was, which was across a big uh, open area. And he said, there's a late registration over there. You're not waiting. You take these envelopes to that little temporary building beside the seminary and you register. You're going to start. And it was in less than two weeks. I said, but I don't have any money. And he said, you just give them these envelopes. And so for the rest of my seminary, which was two more years of graduate study, I would just go and give them the envelopes and, my, and the money was there. So that when, was taken. When, when was this? This was in 1974. Wow. And you were just out of college or out of high school? I was school? just out of, I, was, I had had one year of graduate studies. Mm. Uh, a college that I attended for my undergraduate degree wanted me to come back and teach, and they had offered to hold a position for a year if I did a, a year of graduate studies and did a master's degree. So I was in the process of, of doing that master's degree at University of Iowa when I was invited to come to interview for the military chaplaincy at the Mother Church, the First Church of Christ Scientist. Noted that you did a lot of education to become the highly qualified chaplain that you are. Not only did you go to Boston University in the Divinity Theology School, but you also graduated from Stanford University in the School of Religion. Correct. And that's on the mm-hmm. on the uh, civilian side. Mm-hmm. And then on the military side, you did the Army War College, the Command and General Staff Course, the Chaplain's Officer Advanced Course, and the Chaplain's Officer Basic Course. Mm-hmm. Now, I should point out that over the years since, uh, <laughs> since, since you did this, you had a lot of firsts, which were not easy, which is the, the fundamental, I wouldn't call it a problem, but the fundamental challenge is that you're a female in a military organization that's, if not mostly 100% male. Back in those years, it was very clearly a male organization. And your memoir describes many incidents in which it was made clear by your fellow officers and recruits that you were not welcome. And I don't want you to repeat it all now, because Obviously, you have to read the book, but your first impressions were not so much feeling welcome, it was just the opposite. Was it, is that true? If the first five years were pretty challenging. People were very much wrestling with that idea of women even being admitted to the military. So it was not uncommon. Um, I had one lieutenant who would walk around a building rather than salute me because he could not bring himself to salute a woman. People would say, you just you shouldn't be here. Or other chaplains would say, women shouldn't be chaplains. So it was pretty overt resistance in those first five years. Because it's a pretty intimate job you have. You're doing ministry to army men who are part of a military war machine, and they got to confide, so to speak, to a woman who may be even older or younger than their mothers. I mean, it's a theological challenge, is it not? Uh, It was for many people. For a young soldier, less than than people who were actually the more senior adults going to chapel services. In the Army, you're actually embedded in a unit, and so your soldiers were very convinced that maybe you were somebody they could talk to if you could do the 12-mile road march they were doing that day. And where they might not come to your office and talk to you, if you were the chaplain who did that 12-mile road march and got up at 3.30 a.m. to do it, they might come up and walk alongside of you and say, you know, chaplain, there's something that's been bothering me. Could we talk? And you did the 12-hour, 12-mile march? Correct. And you did all the other physical things that required, which in those days meant essentially that you were the only woman in the group. Right. My first unit was an infantry unit, and and (laughs) so (laughs) infantry armor and what was called signal, which is the communications Mm. people. So there were no women in those branches at that point. And were you treated as a male or female? Chaplains are kind of a different category, and it was it was you did feel as if you were being treated as a chaplain. But when you, when you made the six and a half mile run or the nine and a half nine mile run, 
I often said they wouldn't care if you were a kangaroo. If you could do that, then you begin to have credibility in their eyes because then you were effective. So the question comes to you is, was this prejudice or did just want, they wanted you to prove yourself? In the military, I think everybody has to prove their self, but they wouldn't necessarily assume a man couldn't do it. They would, they, their assumption up front was that a woman couldn't do it. And in this and, case, you could. There and was, when you showed them you could, then that was striking to them. You weren't put up to anything that you couldn't succeed at doing at? There was a lot of people that said it's almost impossible to go from two miles running in basic training to six and a half miles in your first day in the military. To me, I've never thought of it as a human undertaking. If you're a chaplain, you're there to be there to represent God's word with his people. And so I just knew it wasn't my strength. It, it had to be a more spiritual sense of strength. I'm going to backtrack just a little to okay. why you chose to be a military. Did you fall into it, or was it your plan to be a military chaplain, or maybe just a chaplain? You're obviously happy in doing what you've done. You stayed in the military for two tours, and you do advise the brass now, so you like what you're doing. But what made you think about doing this when, before you even arrived in Boston? Actually, people came to me and told me that uh, that were familiar with the chaplain program for our church. Mm. They would hear me give a testimony of healing in a mm. Wednesday evening service, and mm. actually a reader mm -hmm. uh, came up to me afterwards and said, you need to interview for our church's military chaplaincy. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, I didn't know we had one. Mm -hmm. So I was referred to an active duty chaplain in the Air Force who was nearby to go for an initial interview. In Iowa. No, he was actually in Indiana, but oh, okay. uh, went yeah. very close. And so yeah. I drove over and, and did that interview and then mm -hmm. received a call from Boston asking me if I would come to interview here at the Mother Church. And that's when I told him I didn't know how to fly on an airplane. <laughs> and in those so, days, not everybody flew. Right, yeah. right. So uh -huh. they kind of had to walk me through the process of how you fly on and an airplane. They didn't have screening on the planes either. You just walked on, No, right? you just walked on. <laughs> oh, so it's like getting on a bus. But they Correct. Didn't, you had to be told it's like getting on a bus. Correct, yeah. Uh, I see. Things have changed. Yeah. Well, uh, well I, and I didn't have any money to do it, so they uh, wired me. They explained how they could wire me the mm -hmm. um, airline ticket. So you arrived in Boston, you got all three important things in life done in one day, with how much money in your pocket? At that time, I probably only had $60. When, when they told me to come and, and actually mm -hmm. go over and sign up for seminary, I yeah. only had $250. Mm -hmm. But I didn't have, as you say, that first day, I didn't have a place to stay and I didn't have a job. It was when I was coming back to tell them that the seminary had given me my tuition, mm -hmm. a young woman walked off the ele elevator and said, here at the Mother Church and said, I don't know why I'm saying this to you, but do you need a place to stay? And I said, well, I do, but I don't, I don't know how I would pay for it. And, and the security guard that was standing beside us at the elevator said, well, why don't you work as a night, uh, evening security guard? That's what some of the other chaplain candidates have done. Mm -hmm. And so he took me down to the head of security who said he would take a chance and let me try to work security. So by the that afternoon, I had the place to stay, the tuition, and the job. So <laughs> the Lord is good. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But back to my earlier question, uh, people are telling you you should be a chaplain. Right. But, of course, you agreed to it, but you still had to want to do it, didn't you? Well, I I just didn't know what it was. And, and there's a beautiful line in a hymn that we have that says, He leadeth me in unsought ways. Mm -hmm. And I've always felt like each step of the way, somebody's come to me, and, and even though I haven't sought it, it's been very clear to me that it's seeking me. When people kept telling me, you need to go into that program, it, it, the third or fourth time you hear it, you begin to think, well, this is very much something I should listen to. And would I be correct in saying that you recognize the fact that you had this gift? I have, because I have loved Christian science and studied the Bible and the Christian science textbook since I was about seven. God has walked with me every step of my life, and I just knew that he was with me in this, and that I, it seemed very clear to me that he was leading me in that direction. Almost predetermined. I think for God it was. <laughs> you just didn't know it. I just time. was, and probably I was good for the military because I was very good at being what I call it a spiritual position of attention. Mm -hmm. Because when when you hear God telling it to you, you don't say, "Well, I'm going to question you, God." You salute and you follow orders. 
the challenges were not so much physical from the enemy, meaning another country or another right. military. It came from within, right? Within the ranks that you were ministering, so to speak. I read in your book how you had one military guy poking you hard with his finger into your chest so that you had to back up or you'd fall over. You've had other guys spit on you in uniform. You've been run off the road by cars, I think, more than once, if not. At least uh, once, at for least sure, yeah. Once, for sure. Uh, you had epithets thrown at you. And at all these times, people knew you were there as a female chaplain in a essentially male hierarchy. And you were amongst, or if not the first female chaplain in the army. I mean, where were you? This is all groundbreaking okay. back then. Tell sure. me. Um, I think the first woman was a Navy chaplain, and that yeah. was um, in 1973. Mm -hmm. or, sorry, I think 72, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. And then I came in in 74. Mm -hmm. The Army was just a little bit later than the uh, Navy, so they started, I believe, early in 75. So there was one woman in, in the, cl the first class in 75, and there was a second woman chaplain in the second part in the second six months of 75 and then my roommate and I came in in 1976 so depending on who, whether she was the third or the fourth we were both in the same basic course right so sense, you were yeah. amongst the very first, first yeah, handful. and you survived yeah. you don't know if the others did or not I know that um, the first two women were not promoted at their first promotion break they did not make that promotion from mm -hmm. captain to major Diana and I my roommate were promoted to um, lieutenant colonel. Mm -hmm. At lieutenant colonel, she did not make the promotion to colonel. And mm -hmm. so uh, that made me the first woman to be promoted to colonel in the so army I, chaplaincy. So you could be properly addressed as Colonel Janet Horton, retired, <laughs> right? But I've discovered, uh, as I learned to understand more about what you do, that you're not really retired. You might be retired from the military <laughs> yeah. system, but you're providing lots of inspiration and advice to the military. Is that true? Because the chaplain endorsers, the people who credential chaplains to go in the military for all the churches meet together once a year, mm -hmm. that's a very large body of, of people with a lot of informal power because the military can make anybody any sort of profession, whether it's a drive a truck, whether it's fly a plane or whatever it is, the thing they cannot do is they can't make anybody a clergy person or a, a religious ministry professional. And so they have to borrow those people from churches. And so this body of churches who give their chaplains to the military, in essence, they have to lend them to the military, has a great deal of informal power because the military can't do it without them. And it's the only military rank that can't be done through merit. Correct. On the field or anywhere. Correct. <laughs> Only a church can, can either uh, ordain or endorse a and, chaplain. And effectively, you have to prove yourself to your church. Correct. And that's true for any chaplain in any religion that is endorsed. Correct. I yeah. see. Now, explain to me, I've heard this phrase endorsed mentioned a few times. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? That means that somebody has said, this person is for real a Catholic priest, or this person is for real a rabbi, or this person is for real an imam or this person is for real a Christian science chaplain because no other person than the tradition itself can say they didn't just make this up or get their credentials out of the back of a magazine or something and so churches actually or religious organizations have to actually come and register with the Department of Defense if they want to be able to provide chaplains to the military. And that's where the word endorse the, Correct. the church organization has to endorse you Correct. to represent them That's right. in a military branch. Right, because only the church themselves can say this person truly represents our faith group. So they're saying you are truly a Christian scientist. Correct. Uh -huh. By practicing it and Correct. proving it Correct. every day. You had challenges as anybody knew as a chaplain, untried on the field, so to speak, but you were in a number of theaters, uh, mm -hmm. in, especially in Europe and the uh, Near East, did you practice Christian science to do your chaplaincy? And did your chaplaincy involve just Christian scientists or anybody in the military wanting religious help or advice? The military is very different than the civilian organizations because the military takes people overseas or they take them into an operation that's a, a military operation. And there's no way for those soldiers or sailors or airmen to go find religious support. So the military has to bring religious support for them. 
and they have people of, of over 200 just Christian traditions. They have many uh, other faith groups as well. I'm going to interrupt you. You said sure. traditions and faith groups. What's okay. the difference and how many are there okay. in the military's um, eyes? Major faith groups would be like Muslim, uh, Christian, Jewish, Buddhist, uh, Hindu, and, and so they represent an entire difference in, in mm -hmm. a religion per se. Within a religion, within the Christian tradition is what we would call it, you've got Catholic, you've got many Protestant denominations. So those nuances all come into play in terms of, of the term that you use. And so when we say a major faith group, we're talking about the difference between, say, a Muslim and a Christian. But all of these folks are in the military. And so what the military has to do is they have to get all of their chaplains together, and they want them from many, many different um, Christian traditions. They want them from many different faith groups so that they can coordinate together to make sure that every soldier or sailor has the religious support that they need when they take them to the, to the missions that they take them and to. And who initiates the religious support? Does the individual recruit say, I want religious help? Or does the army mm -hmm. say, you, you, you are registered as a Buddhist, you're going to talk to the chaplain before battle? Um, the individual themselves determines... And as I said, some military members, because you, you happen to be the chaplain that's assigned to their unit, and you happen to be the one that did the 12-mile road march, many times to that person, he wouldn't care if you were a kangaroo. What they care is if you're effective. So much of your uh, religious support that you provide is things like counseling. It may be that somebody just is very sad because a, a, a grandfather's passed on. Much of the counseling you do it isn't denominationally based. It's need based. And so they because you're their unit's chaplain, they don't care what your tradition is. Ah. If you go to chapel services, now that's where you're actually doing a specific religious service. Wherever they're stationed, you have to see is there a Catholic chaplain there? Is he providing a mass today? If not, you have to coordinate to have a chap a Catholic chaplain flown in to do mass. I see. So even though you were endorsed by the Christian Science Church and, and the military invited you in to be a chaplain accordingly, you serviced those in the Christian tradition. You didn't have to advise Jewish folks, did you? Or, oh, there, or were, there, are, there were times that Jewish folks might be very comfortable talking to you if, it was, if they felt like it more it was a family issue versus a religious issue per mm -hmm. se. If they needed a sacrament... Mm -hmm. Administer, right. then I'm, that would I'm, be different. I'm, I'm, I'm talking about the religious tradition. That's mm -hmm. different, you know, last mm -hmm. rites and things like sure. that. Sure, But when, when the recruits are talking with you and seeking advice, either mm -hmm. religious or just emotional, mm -hmm. uh, did they even know you were from a particular religious persuasion? Or do they? Did you have to tell them, or it didn't matter? Um, the recruit would know somewhat. They would at least know what your major faith tradition, because you wear a, what's called a... a, a tradition insignia on your uniform. So mm -hmm. a Christian chaplain wears a cross. A rabbi wears a little insignia that looks like a set of tablets for the Ten Commandments. Mm -hmm. a, a Buddhist has a specific mm -hmm. insignia. So at least looking at you, they could probably tell your major faith group. But again, because they're so uh, unit-oriented and you're the person that is geographically where they are, if they've found they have credibility in the way you've conducted yourself or the wisdom that you've expressed as they've seen you do your work, they may, they may set that aside because they, they have credibility in you. So you were primarily accessed by the recruits, I call them recruits because it went all the way up to mm -hmm. officer status, I believe, sure. is uh, they were looking at you as a Christian, not as a particular denomination. And of course you didn't, probably weren't allowed and you didn't, practice the tenets of a particular religion, you just went back to the Christian tradition and stuck with the Bible? Uh, much of what your ministry would do as a Christian chaplain would be based uh, solely on the Bible. Mm -hmm. the, the times that you might be more specific is there are times that a, a specific individual would request Christian science ministry. In, German, in Germany and in um, Korea, mm -hmm. up on the DMZ, we had a young private who was a Christian scientist, and he wanted to go to a Christian science lecture, and he wanted to be able to talk to a Christian scientist. 
So his unit's chaplain called me knowing that I was a Christian science chaplain that was within Korea. But that's like a hen's tooth in a huge organization. Well, correct, yeah. Uh-huh. It, it, and so there are even times today that a, if, if a Christian scientist in the military wanted to talk to a Christian science chaplain, they might have to Skype. Mm-hmm. So it, with the technology, that's, that's done a little bit easier now. But your range and field of work as a... Now that you're retired, you don't do it directly for the recruits, but you still do it in general. Is it's first Christian, and then, if necessary, Christian science. Correct. Because uh-huh. of course, the general Christian population is huge compared to a small religion like Christian Science. Correct. The area I wanted to ask you about is, of course, the whole nature of Christianity of the Old as well as the New Testament is loving your fellow man. Here you are as a chaplain representing. God in a way, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. About love and fellow man and other phrases like that. Mm -hmm. And yet you're working for and in a military war machine. Mm -hmm. How did you reconcile that in your thinking? Most people assume the term war, but what it is is actually the Department of Defense. Our nation was founded on the concept and in fact, what you see on the military insignia, it's, a, it's a, a crest that you wear, is this will defend. And our nation was founded when the people who were here in the states versus in the colonies, in essence, at that time said, we can't abide by what we're being asked to do from Great Britain. So they drew a line in the sand and said, these are the values we will defend. And so what the military does is they are the Department of Defense. We have never been a war aggressor Mm -hmm. um, in in, uh, any time that I've been in the military. Our missions are actually peacekeeping missions or peacemaking missions, or it might be conflict resolution. But um, what most people don't understand is there's so many levels of engagement. Most people think, okay, there's pacifism and then there's nuclear holocaust at the other end of the spectrum, but there's hundreds of different variations of that in between, mm-hmm. which was what just war tradition was about, is that if, the, if, the, if anybody was going to do a military conflict, it had to be with a just cause. And so if you study that, it was actually the Christian church who brought those precepts into understanding to people. And you often have to describe this recruits you're talking with who were sitting there, I'm tra- trained to kill. Because when I was in there, it was only voluntary. You did not have people wrestling with, the, with that issue as much as people did prior when there was a draft. I see. Yeah, the draft, they didn't ask whether you believed in killing or not. Correct. If you volunteered, that's part of the deal. Well, and even during the draft, there were conscientious objectors. So Mm -hmm. you you could ask for conscientious objector status. I'd like to ask you about, when I say your current work, the work you started doing after you retired as a colonel, because you timed out of the tours and all this, but it turned out you become even more in demand by the military because you consult for them. Because I had some very um, specific briefings that I did, um, one of those was on the terrorist mindset. It's a little-known mindset called divine command morality. The briefing I would do would help them understand why we mispredicted that mindset and how we would project the way we think on other people rather than trying to understand how they thought. And this is a very problematic mindset that has troubled all three Abraham traditions. It's been difficult for extremists in in Islam, it's been difficult for extremists even in Judaism, and difficult for extremists in the Christian tradition. So we saw it at Waco, we saw it in Uganda at the Movement for the Restoration of the Ten Commandments. Um, We've seen it in modern-day terrorists that are Muslims, and Judaism really wrestled with it at Masada. So I was helping them understand a mindset that they were mispredicting and misunderstanding. When you say helping them, but them were not um, recruits. No, no, this would have been, been, um, yes, I I was doing this briefing largely when I was at uh, the colonel level and above. So it was at the highest levels of command in Europe, uh, at the Pentagon, in the interagencies. That would be like, um, it would be the... um, Let's see, Joint Military Intelligence School, the D- Defense Intelligence Agency. I did a threat briefing for the CIA uh, threat assessment crew, Homeland Defense, well, U.S. Why, Marshal's Office. That's why they explained yeah. it's so hard to get hold of you. Yeah, right. No, I was traveling um, a great deal for that. Yeah. 
this is all independent of being a female chaplain. Correct. Because you're trained yeah. with your religious schools and all. Right. But on top of that, you also consult for the military in regard to uh, sex discrimination, in regard to, I guess you would call it rape, and you have to advise the brass and them forming their policies. Mm -hmm. It all trickles up, right? It doesn't trickle well, down. Correct. I, I had, back in 1977, I started some of the earliest uh, rape prevention classes, and mm -hmm. because I taught it in such a different manner, it became well known. By the time I was a colonel, my uh, lesson plans I was teaching from the, it was actually the mil medical people who would see the victims in the medical way would be so struck by what it had benefited them. They took my lesson plans to the Pentagon and they got adopted by the Department of Defense. So mm -hmm. that's how I became very well known for those lesson plans and for advising on those issues. So, you, you know, this week you're in London and next week you're somewhere else in your U.S. Mm -hmm. because you, A, know what you're talking about, <laughs> and B, you have the experience. And since you're not tied down with being in the ranks because you're retired, you actually are not retired. You're ever busier than you've been before practicing what you love to practice. Am I summarizing that correctly? Yeah, I do feel very busy. It's, it's, I always said the retirement didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> Phase two. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you look forward to it. I do very much, You're going to yeah. be doing it for many, many decades yeah. to come, I would presume. I, I look forward to it because unlike other people, and I'll use rape prevention or, or mm -hmm. rape assistance, my approach was healing that. Mm -hmm. And that was very striking to people. And that's why I've, uh, it, it's very rewarding if what you're trying to bring to the institution that wrestles with it or the individual who's experienced it is that you're there to heal this idea and give people a higher concept on it. That's the difference between chaplaincy Correct. and being a regular military person. Correct. You bring yeah. it back to God. Right. You use your own private religious uh, tradition, I guess you want to call it, to protect yourself, I believe. And you've pointed that out in your book, how many all these incidences you were not actually harmed, but came mm -hmm. close, yeah. but you prayed about it. The last thing I wanted to bring up is how if you're representing the Christian tradition, as opposed to your particular church, mm -hmm. that generally means the Bible, the New as well as the Old Testament. Okay. And whenever you had someone come to you asking for counseling or dealing with any issue of any sort, private or, or military, you always brought them to a Bible story. Is that correct? With Christians, that was very powerful, and even there was a time that uh, a wonderful rabbi asked if I would join him and teach a class on prayer for some of his folks, and because we so value those beautiful insights of the Psalms and so much of the Old Testament, mm. it wasn't uncommon for something of that order to happen as well, but mm. I'm convinced that there's a Bible story that parallels nearly anything a human being could experience. In this this century, in, as opposed correct. to 2,000 years Correct. Uh, the, and that's how you develop your common ground with whoever you're working with, and it doesn't matter which, which particular church you come from. Correct, yeah. They nice. value that word, that word of God in the Bible, yeah. Well, thank you so much for your time. Well, thank you. It's so interesting. It's so interesting. It's so, it's so interesting. interesting. It's interesting.